Historical materialism is the Marxist method of analysing history. And so I guess in order for us to have this discussion, first we need to ask and answer, what is history? What are we claiming to analyse here? And I think that on a basic level, um, some people might say that history has been a series of events, things that have happened. And history then, as we know it and as we're taught it, is the telling of those events and, and a partial explanation at the same time. But for Marxists, when we talk about analysing history, this isn't really a literary exercise for us. We aren't interested in just description. And I think that the content of history can be described as human life. History is the development of life and its needs. In the German ideology, Marx says that the production of the means to satisfy our needs is the first historical act. And that act of initially producing leads to the extension of more needs. This is the second historical act, the production of new needs. And what that means is, as humans can labour and create and develop things to satisfy our needs, that forms the basis for all of society. And therefore, history is the development of society and the development of that process. So rather than rooting it in the minds of human beings, this kind of telling of events and stories, which is definitely how I was taught about history in school, Marx rooted history in labour, in the labour of humans. And this was one of the key tasks of Marx, of making history scientific. And I think that is where we fundamentally differ from modern bourgeois historians' take on history. Because before Marx, history was understood through morals and stories and myths. But Marx recognised that the development of labour, of human labour, and the subsequent tools that came with that process and what that produced has changed over time and has progressed over time as well. In the same way that there are laws that govern nature and the natural world, so too are there laws that govern history. Marx famously said that conditions determine our consciousness, our conditions determine our consciousness, and it is our consciousness as human beings that separates us from animals and the animal kingdom and allows us to progress and push society forward. But crucially, that consciousness is not separate from the material world at all. It's not alien to it. But actually, human beings and their relationship with nature and the natural world has developed over time. So I think that most bourgeois historians and, econ and e economists sorry, would deny the idea that history could be scientific at all. The most dominant view, I would say, is that history and human society as well is random because it's determined by all the ideas of every different individual in that process. Every individual has wanted certain things in history and, and that is how we've arrived where we are today. They've had different needs and different desires and that, that process, that need to survive, is how we, we've gotten here, self-preservation, essentially. But I think that these kind of basic, vague ideas, such as self-preservation, can't really explain the changes that have taken place in history. And we have to explain these by reference to something else. Because hasn't our social nature fundamentally changed many, many times? Is our social nature today the exact same as it was a thousand years ago? And the Marxist answer to that is that no, it's not. And I'm going to try and flesh this out a little. So Darwin, and Marx was a big fan of Darwin and, and what Darwin did um, in science, Darwin showed how species developed over time through their relationship to nature. And that scientific method is what we apply to history, to explain its development, not through the individual wills and desires and wants of human beings, but rather through the development of the productive forces. Because essentially, that what makes us human is labour and the subsequent tools that has brought into society. And that is our history, history, I would say, as a species, as, as human beings. Engels actually points out that the upright posture marks the transition from ape to man in a very materialist explanation. <coughs> and this is something that has been confirmed by many modern anthropologists, um, even in recent times. Because the upright posture liberated the hands for gripping with an opposable thumb. And this enabled tools to be used and then to be developed even further beyond that. The upright posture also allowed early humans to rely more on their eyes rather than um, other senses in order to sense the world around them and see what was going on. And this use of the hands developed the powers of the brain through the medium of the eyes as well. And this is really why Marx was such a fan of Darwin, 
who kind of went up against the might of science and philosophy at the time with that materialist approach. And I think we could say that just as Darwin discovered um, the law of evolution in organic nature, Marx discovered the law of evolution in human history. I'm just going to give an example of this. So when farming began um, in the Middle East around 10,000 years ago, this represented a revolution, really, in human society and culture. Because new conditions of production by way of this farming gave men and women more time. It gave them more time, simply, for complex analytical thought. And this was actually reflected in new art that came out at the time, new art consisting of geometrical uh, patterns. And this is the first example of abstract art in history. And so these new conditions simply produced a new outlook on life and new social relations and relations to nature and the natural world that existed around them at the time. And because of this change, the way they understood nature advanced rapidly due to the demands of agriculture, the demands that farming brought to them. And this allowed them greater power over the natural world at the same time as well. And that was the exact result of the collective labor that farming had produced, that collective labor on a grand scale. <coughs> and so that difference in farming that led to various other social manifestation was marked by that change in production, that change in the way they organized. And this really, really sums up Marx's whole approach to history and his kind of seminal work in doing so. In the, and we, you know, we quote that he discovered that mankind must first of all eat and drink, have shelter and clothing, before it can pursue politics, science, religion, and art. So why do we pay attention to this, and why is this so important for Marxists and our view of history? And it's because historical materialism explains these different processes, these different stages in history, <laughs> scientifically, in terms of their ability or inability to develop the means of production and develop the, the productive forces. And that is because without that development, human society simply can't progress. And the productive forces really are the material foundations upon which society, culture, and civilization are built. When the productive forces develop beyond the limits of the social structure that exists, it becomes fettered. But this also means that there is a basis for a new form of social arrangement, which will allow for further development. And each different social system throughout history and the different stages that I'll go into a bit more later, from slavery to feudalism and indeed capitalism, which is what we live under today, has served to take um, humanity and human society forward through that development of the productive forces and that form of organizing. <coughs> And I think that when we look at the whole of history and the different stages that it's been through, we can see that each different form of production, each different mode of production, manifested itself in a different social outlook. It manifests itself in a different form of psychology, a different morality, different laws, different religions to a certain extent. And also, each of those different systems believed itself to be the last and ultimate one, believed itself to be the best form of society that there could be. And those ideas that came out of those societies, that morality, that law, and all of that religion, were rooted in the class relations that existed at the time, that had come out of the economic basis of society. And just to give one example, if we take the cultural um, ideas around adultery, for example, I don't know if anyone was in the session yesterday um, in defense of Engels explaining of a lot of the origins, the origins, sorry, of women's oppression um, and where that came from. But today, adultery and our cultural ideas around that, um, you know, I think some people would believe that it's an innate biological thing that exists in humans to be anti-adultery and anti, you know, a woman being able to um, um, have a, a extramarital sex, for example. But a lot of what that session explained is why this is nonsense. Because, you know, yesterday we discussed the beginnings of monogamy in a certain sense, but more importantly, why monogamy was a necessity and why it became essential for that society when it developed. And the necessity of monogamy and consequent shunning and condemning of women who didn't conform to that came from the beginnings of class society and the beginnings of a surplus. And so the relationship between the economic base of society and the ideas that come out of it is a complicated one, but still fundamentally rooted in that. And it's not a strict mechanical thing, and we have to you know, look at all the different factors at one time. And it can even be contradictory at times. But ultimately, what 
Marx did was root the social relations of human beings in the economic base of society. And I think the, the I think history and the changing you know ideas around morality and that has come out of that proves this as well. So all of these systems have ultimately played a role in progressing society and taking it forward. And I want to talk a little bit about this idea of progress and what that means for Marxists when we use the word, because I think it's slightly different from how um, we would use it in a, in a normal, modern sense. Because I think the most mainstream ideas of progress at the moment are that um, is a liberal one, or one that makes it completely random and completely detached from anything material. And the, the liberal idea of progress would be that exploitation has always existed, um, but we've had this cultural development, a process of enlightenment that's taken us to where we are today, essentially. You know, Western capitalist democracy is, is where the whole of society has been pushing itself towards. And I think the other idea of progress, the postmodernist idea, is, is more that there's kind of no real connection in society. There's no scientific analysis to draw any of these events together or why we are where we are today. Um, and that you know, every individual has simply wanted something and, and it's a very kind of pessimistic, random approach to, to why we are in, in, in the world we are today. And I think that what's important to draw out of both of those ideas is that both of them justify capitalism, ultimately. Either you think that we've reached the end point of history um, and all other societies now need to just model themselves off us and model themselves off Western you know, capitalist democracy in that sense. Or you believe that it's completely random and there's no link between them and therefore there's nothing we can do about it. There's nothing we can do to end exploitation or change the world because this is just the way society is and human beings have no control over that ultimately. But as Marxists, we have a dialectical approach to history, and we recognise that it is one of constant contradiction and change, and that is true of progress and the way we use it. And we maintain that the development of human society over millions of years represents progress, of course it does, in the sense that it increases humankind's power over nature, and thus creates the material conditions for achieving genuine freedom for, for men and women. And when I talk about power over nature, I want to clarify, I don't mean deforestation and mankind just ripping through the earth and using it for what, it, for what they want. Freedom from nature means the freedom for humans to actually have agency and control over their lives for the first time um, and in, a, in a serious and genuine way. And our ability today to, to live and overcome climate change proves that necessity, that necessity to have um, power over nature and power over, over our conditions in, in this world. And this is something that Engels understood very well, actually, and understood the need to look at and study the objective laws of the world around us, to know what we can, but also what we cannot do, and understand those limits. Because like, the technology and the resources to live a plentiful life exist today, but we're still bound by this capitalist system. And so history and progress is not a linear thing, um, and that history has a descending line as well as an ascending one. I think that you know, liberals identify one thing as progressive, which is basically what we have today, and then apply that fixed sense of progress to the whole of human history and compare it and measure it to, to where we are right now. But we take a revolutionary approach, and we don't uh, approach history with a fixed morality at all through which we measure things. Because we also know that that which is progressive isn't necessarily good. It's not necessarily a good thing in a moral sense that we might think of today. Slavery had a role in developing the means of production, and so slavery was progressive, which seems like an abhorrent thing to say in, by our standards now, but in a Marxist sense, it's not. And I'm going to explain a bit of what I mean by that. Another you know, argument to go against you know, this idea of human nature, which people often use um, to attack Marxists and the fact that socialism can never exist, is that you know, in ancient Greece, slavery was seen as a completely normal and acceptable thing, even amongst the most enlightened, um, enlightened people at the time. And so when I say that slavery was progressive, you know, Engels makes this point um, in Anti-During, I think, that you need a certain level of the productive forces in order to have a slave in the first place. And that represents a certain amount of progress. The slave needs something to work on. Um, and, need, and you also need enough surplus to then feed that slave. And so it's not just a matter of brute force and forcing someone to do something. And that is, and that is the Marxist um, you know, definition, in a way, I suppose, of progress and what we talk about in terms of its application to history. Because we say that all new systems have brought society forward, including capitalism. 
But that can still be a contradictory process. I mean, Marx says that capital came onto the stage of history dripping blood from every pore. But nevertheless, it was a colossal leap forward for human beings in its development and our power over nature. And just one more kind of point on, on this liberal fixation of progress and, and enlightenment to where we are today. Today's morality, if they believe it really is the end point, lets people die on the streets due to hunger and homelessness. Is that, is that really the end point of humanity? I'd like to think that it isn't. And actually, our earliest ancestors that lived in a very different way that we do today would be disgusted by that and wouldn't really understand it. And who is and who is right? You know, which morality is this the more progressive one? And I don't think that's something that can just be explained on the basis of ideas alone. It has to be rooted in something more fundamental. And I just want to go on to explain this: the fact that you know classes haven't always existed in society. The majority of history was communal and organised within different groups, and that society divided into classes has actually only existed for about ten thousand years, which is one hundredth of the time that mankind has been on this planet. And for the rest of that time, uh, humans, uh, th there was no class society, which means certain things. It means there was no state, there was no enforced inequality, and there was also no family in the modern sense. But that's something that was dealt with in a, in a session yesterday, so I'm not going to explain that um, um, any further. And actually, these kind of primitive um, communist groups, the, the way that we organised at that sense, you know, did so and were able to survive based on a powerful sense of cooperation, a communal child rearing as well, and respect of mothers and respect of, elder, of elders in the group. And what's interesting then is if you compare that, you know, on a base level to the way we live today and you compare it to the modern family, if, if we, if we want to be crude in the way that liberals do in their approach to history and progress, and compare communal child rearing where everyone has everything they need to the modern family today um, where you might have domestic abuse, rape, violence, orphans. It doesn't really, you know, you could look at that and think, oh, well, actually, that was a much better way of living. Maybe we need to go back towards that. But that's not what Marx is saying, and that's not what Marx meant when, we, when, when he studied um, history. And it wasn't that, you know, our earlier ancestors were just more noble than us and had better ideas than us. But the production relations that, exist at that, that existed at that time produced a different society and a different morality or human nature, whatever, whatever you want to call it. And, but we can't have an idealised view of, of, the, of that time and, and talk about, oh, we just need to return to this. Um, because, the, you know, there were obviously difficulties at that time as well. They didn't have control or power over nature in a way, in a better way, you know, in a greater way, I would say, sorry, that, that we do now. And what we argue for now is not a return to, to that time, a return to those primitive um, communist tribes. Because we have progressed in these days, but we're arguing for a higher society and returning to that, but on a much higher level. So I've explained slightly how the development of the productive forces brings into existence different um, relations and therefore different forms of class society. And this is important because under this primitive communism that I described, there was no basis for an idle class. There was no basis for a group of people that didn't have to work. And so there was no point of enslaving someone else because they could only provide for their own needs. But at a certain point um, in history and in this process, it became possible um, for an idle class to exist because it became possible for there to be a harvest, to live off, and even produce a surplus. And this was a marked difference with the way that they had um, led their lives and organised before. And this was the first time the question was, was posed, who gets the surplus after, after we die? And, and what do we do with the surplus that we have? And so now that this possibility of idleness arose for some, but not to an extent that everyone could be idle and everyone could live a, this kind of simple life. Um, mankind definitely could not provide enough for that. And it's on this basis that we saw class societies um, ar arise, societies becoming divided between um, a possessing and a, and a labouring class, the idle group and, and the group that has to work. I don't have time to go into this now, but I briefly kind of talked about the connection with, um, with women's oppression on that. And, and, and it's because we, we take this dialectical approach to history, it's how we can explain that how did we go from a completely classless society to one where we had private property and one where we had classes. And it comes from a question and it comes from a change in, in the production and the means of production. And so I just want to explain more concretely what we mean as well by class when we, when we talk about different classes in society. 
And by a class, we mean a group of people, essentially, who just have the same relationship to the, to the means of production. And the class which owns and controls the means of production and rules society in their interests. And this allows them, um, uh, and this at the same time enables them to force the oppressed, the labouring class, to toil in their interest. And the labouring class is forced to produce a surplus, which the ruling class then lives off. And this separating of society into different groups, playing different roles and division of labour, eventually enters into conflict and births class struggle. But this takes different forms in different locations that we can see throughout history. But ultimately, based on this contradiction of hostile classes, society develops. And it takes steps forward and steps backwards, and it's not a linear thing. But the overwhelming direction of history shows that. And I think that um, this, sorry, this direction of history is, is, has been shaped by these struggles between these two classes. These two classes who are attempting, not two, sorry, but, but these classes who are attempting to mould society fundamentally into their interests. And, you know, obviously, the, I'm sure everyone knows the first words of the Communist Manifesto, which is the history of all hitherto existing societies, is the history of class struggle. And what historical materialism explains and, and displays for us is that the motor force then of social development is rooted in, in that class struggle. And I just want to read out a quote which I think summarises this quite well, which is in the 1885 preface, pre preface to the 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte. It says, it was precisely Marx who had first discovered the great law of motion of history, the law according to which all historical struggles, whether they proceed in the political, religious, philosophical, or some other ideological domain, are in fact only the more or less clear expression of struggles of social classes, and the existence, and thereby the collisions too, between these classes, are in turn conditioned by the degree of development of their economic position, by the mode of their production, and of their exchange determined by it. And so this class struggle has always existed and formed as the, and, form, and its formation has been the main um, engine of progress. And I want to try and um, give a, concretize this a bit more um, by giving an example and um, by talking about, um, in, a, in, a, in a very small and crude, if you will, way, the transition, I suppose, between feudalism um, and capitalism, because that is something that deserves a, its, its, its own discussion and it definitely won't flesh out all of the points. Um, but I just want to highlight a few things, um, which is that you know, under feudalism, we had this structure where, that was based on a kind of pyramid in which God and the king uh, stood at the top of this kind of hierarchy. And uh, each segment was linked to everyone else based on duties and the duties that they supposedly had to, to each other. And in theory, you had feudal lords who existed to protect um, the peasants and the peasantry and um, in return for that the peasants would put food on their table and clothes on their backs and this kind of enabled them to live a, a life of luxury, of idleness um, like I described earlier but you also had priests and the, the role of the priests would have been to, to pray um, for, for their souls and, and the knights who had defended them and so on and so on so you had this complex um, and very different if we take today way of living but even in that process, class struggle existed. And uh, you know, the transition, and when we start to see the beginnings of, of capitalism in a certain sense, so, you know, started with the, the serfs um, who were struggling against their lords. Um, and in doing so, you know, we started to see the beginnings of towns and, and the beginnings of the bourgeoisie, who were the kind of first escaped serfs, if you will, and the development of, of commodity exchange and, and various other things. And you know, at a certain point, basically, we see this rise of this new group of people, this new class, the bourgeoisie, um, who had fundamentally different interests to that of the, of the, the dominant class at the time, the, the feudal um, aristocracy. Um, but it wasn't as simple as, OK, we've got these new people now, and therefore I think we need to change the way society is run. That's obviously not how history manifests itself. That's not how change happens. And you know, capitalism couldn't just move onto the onto the stage of history without any without any struggle, without any hindrance at all. And you had these these newly awakened productive forces that were now in, in revolt. They were in conflict with the old way of, of, of organizing, the old means of the old relations, sorry, of production. And this had to be overcome and new relations needed to be installed to correspond to this new way of, of organizing that had developed. Um, and though feudalism in a certain sense was maybe starting to decline, 
the, the landed interest in society remained this fetter, this fetter on, on commodity production. And so the, this battle of living forces, this battle takes place over, over a number of years. And we can't point to a certain year and say, right, that's it, that's when capitalism developed. But we can look at certain things in that time and see how that accelerated the class struggle to a certain extent. Um, and one example of this um, that uh, is, uh, so in history, I'm sure we're all taught about Henry VIII, for example, which might seem a bit random, but I'm going to hopefully link this. Um, and, you know, Henry VIII's kind of role in history and his division of, 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 of religion in that sense was all because of um, his, his divorce, right, or the, his, his want for a divorce. And we're all taught, you know, divorce beheaded died, divorce beheaded survived. And this, you know, fat, greedy man just wanted, a, you know, wanted this woman, and the Pope said no. And so he had to force his nomin. And that, for some reason, is the entirety of the basis of why um, our whole country was split in two in terms of, in terms of religions. And you know, he was significant in a certain sense. His desires and wants represented something. But ultimately, what was he doing? And what did that process do in terms of the development of the class struggle at that time and the development of the, of the new growing bourgeoisie, which was in his process, in his kind of wrecking of, of, of the Catholic Church, and taking, you know, he took the monasteries at a cut down price and he sold them to upcoming landlords at the time. And this accelerated this process, this emergence of, of a new class, of a new group in society. And that is the class struggle. And that is what the historical materialist method allows us to do. It allows us to look at these things and actually explain them on a much deeper um, basis than the superficial wants and needs of, of, of individual humans. And so this emerging kind of bourgeois class, this new class, um, uh, which takes form in many different ways in different countries, which I can't go into all of them, this class struggle was the task then of the bourgeois revolutions. The English Revolution, obviously, of the 1640s, the American Revolution um, in 1776, and, um, and the subsequent Civil War. And just kind of on that, a brief kind of aside to um, specifically in America, you know, just as I explained earlier that slavery was, one pro was once progressive in a certain sense in terms of its ability to push society forward, if you take America, the abolition of slavery then was even more progressive um, in, a, in the sense that it set free the introduction of capitalism fully. The American Civil War was a contest between the North and the South, the Southern landowning um, classes that wanted to maintain slavery because of their form of production, and the Northern states that um, wanted to set free capitalism across, across the country. And it was the abolition of slavery um, that allowed that to happen. And Marx was, you know, paid attention to that very closely precisely because the abolition of slavery was a great step forward for the, for the development of the working class in America, which I'm going to end on when talking about the role of the working class. And um, Marx was very concerned about this and followed it closely. And you know, Marx says that labor in the white skin can never be free, while labor in the black skin is branded. And you know, he's talking about slavery and talking about the fact that slavery had to end for the working class to grow and then organize and develop. And that is why, in that sense, the abolition of slavery was progressive. And that's just an example of this kind of contradiction and change, and that progress is not a linear thing that we can point A to B at. Um, but that's just one um, example of that. Um, the French Revolution, of course, um, I'm not going to ex explain or go into any of these in, in any specific detail, but these were all decisive struggles that laid the foundations for, for the domination of, of capitalism on a world scale. And you know, when any socioeconomic system is entering into crisis, is entering into decline, this is reflected not only in um, stagnation of the productive forces, but um, at every level as well, you know, the decline of feudalism um, was an epoch when um, intellectual life was dead um, or, or dying, right? You had the, the role of the church in particular, which had a really big stronghold and was paralyzing all cultural and scientific initiatives. And so these revolutions and the way they take place is not through one specific event or one specific avenue at all. But the bourgeoisie had to go up against this in, in all its various different forms and, and through law and morality. And the changes in, in, our, in our laws in particular, I would say, in this country really kind of show that. The development of land law um, and, and the rights of, of, of people to own land and the way that developed in England um, definitely demonstrates this. And, and the point is that 
class struggle ultimately was at the heart of that entire process and that is what the historical materialist method allows us to uncover. So I spoke a bit about, um, briefly, uh, the development of the working class in particular and why that was so important for Marx in, in America, but also in general. And I want to explain why that capitalism in its progressive role, you know, developed the productive forces, but also, you know, one of the most important tasks that it did was, was develop the working class and create the working class. And that is important for us because of what it, what it gave society in terms of the tools of society to actually overcome um, these class divisions. The working class came, what came out of the working class then was trade unions, um, political parties, you know, we're, we're talking about the Labour Party a lot at, at, this, at this conference as well. And the, ultimately, the, the, the working class is the progressive revolutionary class in society. And this is important because the proletariat has no weapon other than organisation. That is the only thing they have to go up against um, um, capitalism. Because without organisation, the proletariat is simply just the raw material for, for exploitation. And that is its significance, and that is why we, we talk about the value and the importance of the working class. It's not, it's not a moral thing that we think that they're just the best people in society, but it's a practical, material question as to who controls and who creates in society and therefore has the ability to run it, and, and that is the working class, the labouring class. So... I want to talk a little bit briefly now about the role of the individual then in society because I kind of mentioned a few people like Henry VIII but rooted ultimately um, their, their decisions and their wants in, in the economic <coughs> basis of, of, of what was happening at that time. Um, and in the, in the 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte, Marx actually explains, he says that men make their own history, but they do not make it as they please. They do not make it under self-selected circumstances, but under circumstances existing already, given and transmitted from the past. And so, you know, Marx and Engels explained that participants in history may not always be aware of what motives are driving them and you know may try and rationalize them in, in one way or another but ultimately those those motives have a basis and exist in the real world in the material world around them and you know marxists are often kind of accused of, of being economic determinists of being um, reductionists and in lots of different ways but I don't think we deny the importance or the active roles of individuals in society. The difference with the Marxist approach to history is we place individuals in their historical context. And we understand the role of individuals far better, actually, than um, modern, the kind of modern conception of history, liberal or idealist um, ideas of history, um, because of that. Because we can explain it in a, in a much better sense than, you know, someone somehow was just born with something really, really special. And that is why the whole of society changed. That is why war started, because Franz Ferdinand was shot. That is why millions of people subsequently um, died. But I think we explain it on a, on, a, on, a much, on a much more materialist basis by saying, OK, where does the individual come from? And that they, we say that they are a product of the objective conditions at that time that has given rise um, to a certain crisis. And it's only at a certain point that the role of the individual becomes important. And I'll just kind of give one example of this. I once heard um, someone, someone basically ask, you know, we were talking about Bolshevism and the role of the Bolsheviks, and they said, well, isn't Bolshevism just Leninism? because Lenin had to change the line of the Bolsheviks on so many occasions. Lenin had to fight and correct what the Bolsheviks were doing so many times. So doesn't that essentially mean that, that, that Bolshevism is just Leninism? But the, the Marxist approach to history and our understanding of the role of the, individ of the individual, sorry, is that Lenin couldn't have been Lenin without the Bolsheviks, right? Lenin rose to the, channel to the, to the challenges of that time precisely because of the objective conditions um, and the crisis that was developing. And so there's a dialectical relationship that exists there between Lenin and the Bolsheviks and ultimately between the individual and the conditions of that time. And, and you see this in particular, I would say, in moments of, of, of revolution and in terms of leaders and their relationship to the masses and how one can influence the other in terms of pushing society forward. And so that is where we, um, that is how we understand the role of the individual in particular, um, because we root it in the historical conditions that exist um, um, to create them in the first place. And so, you know, you'd be forgiven for being a bit confused if I'm saying that, you know, individuals by themselves can't really do much. 
you know, what are we all doing here, I guess? You know, we are still actually individuals. And, you know, is it actually possible then to consciously change society? Do we actually have power over that? And I would say, yes, you can consciously change society, but only if you understand the objective processes that are taking place within it. And that is why um, historical materialism is so important to us, because if we understand the laws of history, we understand um, you know, just how much a, a, an individual can do and how and when it is appropriate to intervene in a certain sense. So just to you know, give another example, if you looked at you know, the world around us today and maybe misunderstood or, or you know, didn't have the theory of the class struggle with you, you might call for barricades right now. We just need to build a barricade um, outside Parliament because the working class must be fed up with Boris Johnson and they must be fed up with the Tories. And, and, I'm, and I'm right because, because you know, there's a crisis of capitalism right now and the working class are immediately going to follow you. But if we try to build a barricade outside Parliament right now, we'd just be arrested and then we'd have absolutely no role at all in doing anything to consciously change society. But if you study... Um, history and you study the class struggle, you begin to understand the processes through which we have to understand the objective conditions and how the working class moves, which is ultimately that we as Marxists can't tell the working class, now is the time for revolution, now is the time to move and to storm parliament, and they will do that on, by themselves, and that is not our role. Our role um, as Marxists and our relationship to the working class and its parties um, is not a, a, a kind of uh, one where we're telling them what to do, but one where we have to be a part of the process, um, but understand the laws that are, that are taking place in order to get them to get them through that. And that is why um, we study history and, and, the, and the theory of the class struggle. And so, you know, what does that mean for us today in the, in the fight for socialism? Should we just you know, keep waiting then, you know, for, for the conditions to keep worsening until, you know, the working class will finally realise, I suppose, what's happening and, and move to, to take power. Um, but that's, and, you know, because if you take, okay, there's been process in society, does this mean that socialism is just inevitable? And, you know, our oh, fukes, like, we don't have to worry too much about it. But that's not what um, historical materialism teaches us. And that, you know, Marx actually explains that there is no final crisis of capitalism that will be the tipping point to change everything. The fact of becoming a fetter does not automatically bring about the change in, in, in society that we might want. And ultimately, a revolution still needs to be made by human beings because men make their own history. Humanity does make its own history. And a revolution is a, is a conscious historical act. And that is um, what we have to remember when um, looking at all these processes and everything that's going on in the world today. And so we've emerged from all these different forms of society, slavery, feudalism, um, and you know, now we're in capitalism. And like I said earlier, I think each one of those social systems ultimately believed that it represented the only possible form of, of existence for human systems and that all of its institutions and religions and laws um, were the last form. But I think hopefully what I've described today and what we've understood is that that idea goes against the entirety of human history, the entirety of what has actually happened, and that every stage in the development of society has been rooted in, in its last one and emerged out of it. And I think history can only be understood if you look at it in that, in that kind of way, where um, at a certain point um, a contradiction has emerged and uh, the further development of society, which was necessary, um, needed to take place to allow a new form, a new form of living. And I think that what I just want to end on is that ultimately what historical materialism gives us, I think, is optimism and real optimism for the future and, and what we can do as individuals and as, as everyone sat in this room here today. Because if you, if you look at the world around you, I don't think it's hard to see all of the symptoms of this system's decline. And the ruling class know it themselves. I think they're terrified of it, and they're doing everything they can to try and prevent it um, through various different means. But none of this will be enough, because it is in decline on every single level. And that the, what history gives us, as well as confidence, it gives us confidence, I think, in, in the working class, in the theory of the class struggle, and confidence of the general direction and, and tendency of human history, which has been one in, towards the, the greater development of the productive forces and cultural, um, and cultural potential that human beings really have. And I think that 
gives us not a kind of passive approach in terms of watching these events, the, ama the amazing revolutions that have taken place even this year around the world, but ultimately shows us that we can change the world and therefore we must change the world. Um,